c'était toujours une Okay, so good evening, everybody, and welcome um, to the second uh, of the online seminars in the Where the Disciplines Meet series, the Uniscape series for 2022. And today's um, talk um, is titled um, quite uh, provocatively Designing with Towards Designing Landscapes Where the Species Meet. So to the two speakers, to Bert Deru and to Glenn De Liege. Uh, thank you for uh, playing with the title of the, uh, the series in the title of your paper. I appreciate that. Um, the respondent is Andrea Gammon, and we will introduce Andrea later on when the uh, talk is over. The topic of today's lecture is one which, as soon as the, uh, as the proposal uh, came in, um, we were excited uh, uh, to learn more about it about designing spaces where the species meet to remind us all of a simple truth and essential existential truth is that we share this planet with other living things. Um, we're part of, of a, a, an ecosystem, a very rich and engaging ecosystem. Um, and we need to acknowledge that in the landscapes that we design. So the two speakers, Bert and Glenn, work uh, in the Futures Through Design Centre at the University of Applied Sciences and Arts in Ghent. Um, and I was thinking as I was looking at the video there that had we shown that maybe uh, 30 years ago, people might wonder uh, you know, precisely what it is we're looking at. 
um, um, such as the, uh, the power of modern technology to be able to produce something as interesting and engaging and provocative as that as well. Um, so I'm not going to say too much more because I think that the title of the paper speaks for itself. Um, and the format, as you are now familiar with, is that the speakers uh, will share the platform. I'm not sure whether Bert is planning to, uh, to come in and speak during the, uh, the presentation, but is welcome to do so. Glenn, that's, I, I, I can see you shaking your head there. Um, and when the paper is over, then I'll in invite Andrea to make a response, and then we'll open the, the, uh, uh, the paper up. Uh, to questions and uh, to comments as well. So Glenn, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Andrea, and we look forward to your paper. And I think you uh, you have the facility there to share your screen, so. Sure, uh, thank you, Connor, and thank uh, you everybody for showing up for uh, the presentation of our uh, paper. I was just told it's an informal occasion. If I had known, I have formally written out my paper and I will uh, read out the, my notes, um, which is on our research project and what we are doing in uh, the research uh, uh, for the Center for Decentering Design, the think tank for decentering design, as we uh, like to call it. And indeed, uh, Bert, if you want to join in for the presentation, please do so. But I'll share my screen first uh, so we can start uh, with the presentation. Normally, everybody should uh, uh, see my screen now, I guess. Yes. Okay. So I'll start. So towards designing landscapes where species meet and the place where I would I think it's, like. Oh, oh, oh. It was still black, but now it's showing. Thank you. That's oh, fine. It's not it's showing now. Yeah, yep, this is coming fine. true. That's perfect. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> okay. So uh, towards designing landscapes where species meet, where I would like uh, to uh, begin is maybe a little bit surprisingly, but still with uh, Jacques Derrida, the famous uh, French philosopher, standing naked in front of his cat, feeling a little embarrassed. And this, of course, the opening scene of one of his most famous lectures, uh, lectures, uh, L'Animal Donc, Je suis the animal that therefore I am following, which is a title which winks at the dictum of that other great French philosopher, René Descartes, uh, Je pense donc je suis, I think, therefore I am. Now in the lecture, Derrida looks at how an animal or the animal, although at first conspicuously absent, has left traces throughout Western thinking and cultural identity. Uh, we in turn will be looking for traces of the animal in our own thinking about landscapes. But it is the opening scene of the lecture that interests us the most at this point. So we have Derrida standing there, naked in front of his cat, feeling embarrassed. And almost as soon as Derrida feels embarrassed for his nakedness, he feels embarrassed for being embarrassed. Because after all, why feel, why feel naked in front of a cat? Indeed, one can only feel naked in the eyes of someone else. If no one is there to look, or we feel assured there is no chance we will be surprised by someone's look, we don't feel naked. So if Derrida feels embarrassed in the eyes of the cat, should he then recognize that the cat indeed is a someone, a being with its very own view of the world in whose eyes he can appear as an object to be gazed at in its nakedness. This idea, that animals have their own point of view, actually forms the common ground between two research projects. A new look at, at estates, which is a research product, uh, project conducted by Mirte van Aalst, Bertero and Glenn de Liege, myself, and Future Us, which is a research, research project conducted by Kilian Ganseveles. Uh, both these projects were confronted with the same question. If you recognize that animals have their own point of view, how can we then take that point of view serious within different design practices? Indeed, the animal and its case are today almost completely overlooked in most design practices. And this lacunae led us to form a think tank around the concept of decentering design, the think tank which is situated at the heart of the Hoogent Hoogest Research Center Future True Design which is a newly formed interdisciplinary research center at the intersection of landscape, interior, and digital design. Now, 
Today, we will be, of course, focusing on landscape design and a little on landscape theory. Why? Because what holds for design in general also holds, we still believe, for landscape design in particular. Although things are starting to change, animals in their case are still by and large absent from both landscape design and landscape theory. Why is this so? Now, one reason why we are absent from landscape design in particular is the fact that for a long period of time, animals were basically seen as passive users of the landscape. Building on ideas first formulated by the American botanist uh, Clemens, the development of landscapes, if not disturbed by humans, would be believed to be driven by vegetational succession, reaching a specific climates, climax state. I think we all know this climax theory of vegetational succession. Animals can be present along different stages of the succession. As you can see here, there are a couple of animals at different stages of the succession, but their presence followed that of the vegetation. They were not believed to have any real impact over the different successional, successional stages. Animals follow plants. And it is this prejudice that a lot of landscape design seems to have taken on board. Animals follow plants. Today, of course, we know that this is not always the case. Animals can steer landscape formation and successional stages. The idea of top-down cascading, for instance, was originally developed uh, for uh, describing how sea otters kept dense uh, forests of sea kelp and all of the species which uh, thrive in those dense forests um, in place. Because, of course, these forests depended on others predating on sea urchins, sea urchins which would feast on the kelp. But the most famous example is probably that of the return of wolves to Yellowstone. Now, what happened when wolves returned to Yellowstone? Well, a whole bunch of landscape processes uh, started to happen. Of course, the wolves made sure that, for instance, deer and elk couldn't graze as long along the rivers which meant that trees and other uh, vegetation could uh, restore quicker and develop more along riverbanks, which ensured that there would be more beavers. Beavers with their ponds created more um, room for other kinds of animals to come in and so forth. So we got a much richer landscape simply by introducing wolves. These animals don't seem to be only passively present in the landscape, but are able to steer landscape evolution uh, through time as well. Another example, maybe a little bit less known, is the idea of niche construction, of course. The idea that animals actually create their own environmental niches, and thereby steer their own evolutionary trajectory. Since a niche, of course, determines what evolutionary traits are selected for. A good example here are earthworms, who are still basically aquatic worms, but through their activity, recreate the specific aquatic niche they need to survive on land. In doing so, they co-determine the evolution, evolutionary conditions of all organisms around them as well. If you want an idea how far this can go, you can go and have a look at forest composition change throughout Northern America. Earthworms were largely absent from most parts of North America until they were introduced by European settlers. Their exp expanding range is now changing the tree composition of forests across the continent. As of course, trees which adapt well to the soil conditions created by earthworms are now at a competitive advantage. So the point is landscape design and even landscape theory seems to be quite slow to adapt to these new insights into the landscape forming capabilities of animals. It is almost as if these insights are of no or very little importance. Although there is one type, type of landscape design, if you can call it that, come to that, in which these insights have fully been taken up. And that is, of course, rewilding. In rewilding, animals are seen as the primary landscape engineers or landscape architects. Indeed, according to rewilders, the fact that animals have not yet been recognized in this role as landscape architects or landscape engineers is the result of the fact that at the time when Clemens and his followers developed their climax theories, most landscape shaping animals had actually gone extinct or were at least functionally extinct. 
so that their crucial shaping of the land could not be recognized as such. The rewilding is largely the fringe movement in landscape design and theory. The reason for this is, I think, that rewilding is often seen as letting landscapes go, so to speak, as letting them slowly die out. Why is that so? Well, I think that reveals deep preconceptions about what we believe landscapes to be. Preconceptions such are enshrined in the definition of landscape as formulated in the Landscape Convention, for example. So let's, oh, let's have a look at this uh, definition. The landscape is part of the land as perceived by local people or visitors, which evolves through time as a result of being acted upon by natural forces and human beings. It's very interesting and I think telling definition of landscape. Landscape is seen as something which is being acted upon. So it presents us with some kind of bedrock, some kind of matter or substrate, which is being shaped by natural processes and human beings. Note that the definition makes a neat separation between natural forces on the one hand and human beings on the other. In this definition, animals are quite clearly lumped into one category with the rest of nature. They affect the landscape, the bedrock stuff, as a blind force. Yes, animal behavior can shape a landscape, but if it does so, it does so like the wind or rain can shape a landscape. Just like those other natural forces, animals are not truly creative. The activities they deploy in order to shape the land are purely instinctive. They are encoded, those activities in their genes at birth. Animals simply live out their genetic plan, so to speak, but have no say over whatever is written in that plan. Humans, on the other hand, possess this magical quality called being. With this, we tend uh, to imply that humans can freely shape their relations to the world. Precisely because of this unique freedom, humans can actually shape landscapes according to preconceived plans and ideas, which makes humans truly creative, in the sense that they can always decide to revise the way they relate to the outside world and thus design, for instance, some truly novel landscapes. Indeed, it is precisely this freedom from the natural determination that gives humans culture and history, those spheres of human existence through which humans give form to their individual lives and their societies, wholly independent of any natural predetermination. Now, what this idea of landscape as a type of bedrock, this neat separation between natural processes, natural forces, and human beings as enshrined into the definition of landscape in the Landscape Convention leads to, in my view, is a sort of inherent conservatism in our received notions of landscape. It leads us to assume that for there to be such a thing as landscape, we need the imposition of some kind of human form on the encode, uh, encode uh, substrate of nature, the bedrock stuff. That form is provided by culture and history, those spheres of human existence, which develop according to their own dynamics, freed from all kind of natural determination. Indeed, more often than not, the whole of nature is seen as basically just part of the bedrock stuff, the unorganized matter that awaits the imposition of human form in order to be able to transform the landscape. Indeed, in our received notion of landscape, we see landscape as those places that sit in the middle of a continuum between culture and nature, places where there's a fine balance between a structuring human form and a natural substrate in such a way that the substrate is not fully taken up by or disappearing into the human form. Landscape, as it were, is somehow always the middle ground between culture as the domain of human freedom and nature as the domain of natural predetermination. The result of this view is that the more we let animals perform their instinctual activities in the landscape, the more we shift the necessary balance for something to be called a landscape towards the nature pole of the continuum. Letting animals do their own thing in landscapes implies the landscape, implies that we let the landscape slowly slip away. Indeed, 
In some instances, we can see animals as contributing to the formation of landscapes, but only in those cases where their shaping activities are co-opted to serve as a tool for the imposition of human form, such as when we use cattle to keep historically grazed landscapes from being overgrown with shrubs and trees. Now, you can find an example of this kind of thinking, I think, in, for instance, Feral, one of the key publications by George Monbiot, which helped to spread the idea of rewilding as an existing and forward-looking conservation strategy. In one of the chapters, which deals with the rewilding of the Welsh uplands, uh, Monbiot has a discussion with David Maurice Jones, who still operates as a traditional sheep farmer and is a spokesperson for Welsh upland culture. When confronted with Monbiot's ideas about rewilding, he replies, with, blank, oh, sorry, with blanking, blanket rewilding, you lose your own written history, your sense of self and your sense of pride. It's like book burning. Books aren't written about people like us. If you eradicate the evidence of your presence on the land, you write us out of the story. We've got nothing else. What Maurice Jones is saying um, is that in these landscapes, you find everything which makes people like Maurice Jones human. The landscape is seen as a physical record of their activities on the land. And it is that record of their shaping activities that makes it this, that makes it into a recognizable place with its own specific character. Not just any landscape, but their landscape and their home. You rewild that by letting animals roam free again and determine the development of the vegetation. If you do that, you revert those landscapes back to nature and then they will disappear with those landscapes back into oblivion. A landscape needs the imposition of human form to be considered a landscape. So where does this all get us with regards to taking the animal question seriously in landscape design? Well, not very far, actually. If we already recognize that animals can shape landscapes, such as the ants have been doing in this picture, for instance, splashing some color around, by distributing the seeds of the yellow caradalis along the case sites of the River Tele in Mechelen, we tend to see this shaping activity as a possible threat to the idea of landscape proper, since the purely instinctive shaping activities of animals slowly obliterate human form from the landscape. Now, my proposition is that if we want to take the animal case seriously, we're going to have to get rid of this neat separation between humans and animals and the idea that the landscape is somehow some kind of bedrock stuff, which a neat balance between human form and natural matter has been reached. Can we, for instance, recognize animals as co-designers of shared landscapes so that their activities are not seen in the first place as detracting from landscape, but actually creatively contributing to its formation? For this to happen, what needs to be done is to recognize the lingering Cartesian inheritance at the heart of both our received use of landscape and design. Because it is, of course, precisely what we have been constantly bumping into, some clear-cut Cartesian dualism lingering in our ideas about landscape and design. Indeed, the French philosopher René Descartes, after having ascertained that his own thinking was in fact the first thing he could be absolutely sure of, and I think, therefore, I am, went on to claim that the world existed out of two things. He said it existed out of three things, but we'll leave God out for the moment. Two things on subjects and objects, or better still, thinking minds and extended bodies. Now, as far as bodies go, Descartes claimed that they were ruled by causal laws. The mind, however, is not determined by causal laws and possesses free will. It can thus freely and actively decide how it wants to relate to the outside world of matter, while the outside world of matter is basically passive until some causal force puts it into movement. Because of their minds, humans alone can learn to, how to control those causal factors and thus give form to the outside world according to their own ideas. Is of course precisely this kind of dualism we need in order to conceive the landscape as some kind of passive bedrock stuff 
which needs the imposition of a human form to the common actual landscape. Matter is pure extendedness, according to Descartes. In order for it to mean anything, it needs to be taken up, shaped, even formed by the human mind. This view also leads us to think of design as the imposition of human form, taken from the uh, separate domain of mind or culture from a passive raw material substrate. Now, maybe somewhat surprisingly, such a dualistic Cartesian worldview actually allows for the incorporation of the idea that animals can have their own point of view. The only step we need to take is to recognize that animals are also endowed with minds. We might then even go on to claim that in virtue of animals having minds of their own, animals also possess a form of culture and history, something for which there is growing scientific evidence. Animal behavior is not fully determined by genes, but is also shaped by adaptive learning patterns that are actively being passed down through the generations. But this move in itself does not seem to go far enough. Why? Because this idea will not bring us closer to the idea of humans and animals co-shaping a shared landscape in which they can meet. Indeed, if we simply recognize that animals have minds of their own and thus can impose form of their own on the bedrock stuff we call nature or landscape, or we call nature in order to turn it into a landscape, we still do not escape the idea that whatever form animals will impose on the landscape will necessarily estrange us from that landscape. Indeed, if we can already grant at all that beavers design landscapes in the same sense that humans do, beavers will design beaver landscapes, so to speak, based on their own ideas of what makes an ideal beaver landscape. What we have when we simply adapt the Cartesian dualistic view on landscape design to incorporate the existence of animal minds is a simple multiplication of possible landscape forms, all determined by the specific outlook of on life of the human or animal under consideration. In such a view, all animals, humans included, actually live in their own landscape bubbles, quite oblivious to one, another, uh, one another's views and one, of, uh, uh, one another's experience of the landscape. Indeed, even quite oblivious to one another's existence as species. That is, of course, more or less the view of the Estonian ecologist Jakob von Uxko, uh, the way he envisaged um, the experience of different animal species of the landscape was precisely through this metaphor of the bubble, every species living in its own bubble and unable to break out of it. The spider, the better the fly, does not know of the spider's web, is unable to experience the spider's web, is unable to experience the spider as an other existing species in the landscape. Now, in such a view, of course, all animals are solipsistic. There can be no true co-creation of the landscape. So what we need is a different kind of conception of landscape. And we believe we can find it in the work of British anthropologist Tim Ingold. Now, according to Ingold, the landscape should not be seen as some kind of bedrock stuff, which is constantly being shaped, being given form, by human and non-human shapers. Landscape, in Ingold's view, is not an object, but an activity. It's a form, its form is always emerging. There are indeed no fixed objects in an Ingoldian landscape, only trajectories or becomings, which he often describes as threads or lines. One should not see these threads as things, like shoelaces, for instance, but as becomings, they are constantly unfolding trajectories. That unfolding does not happen in isolation, like how in standard Darwinian views, animals unfold simply according to the plants already encoded in their genes at birth. Becoming for Ingold is always becoming with. The unfolding happens as a constant weaving and unweaving of different trajectories. And it is through these constant reverberations of threads, 
this constant attunement and reattunement of different trajectories that landscape is continuously forming. There is indeed no landscape next to the meshwork of threads, which is the meshwork, this other metaphor which Ingold likes to use when talking about landscapes. The unweaving of threads does not lead to the landscape reverting back to encode matter, but to the unraveling of a particular part of reality itself. Now, of course, in an Ingoldian view, the temporalities of the different trajectories can vary hugely. From the perception of one trajectory, say a human one, which in itself is, of course, only a node in many other trajectories, a trajectory with a long range temporality, say that of a mountain, may appear as a fixed and enduring object. The temporality of the different threads play out over different timescales, with certain nodes enduring longer than others, while at the same time constantly reweaving themselves in the further unfolding of the meshwork. Form, in such a view, is the something which is continuously transforming in reverberation or attunement with the unfolding of all the different trajectories that, that together are busy weaving the landscape. Form is not something we impose from the outside on matter. It arises out of our always being busy in the world, attuning ourselves to the ongoing currents of life there. In whatever plans we make, we can therefore always find the traces, so to speak with Derrida, of the non-human world, of animals, actively unfolding the landscape alongside and together with us. In this view, it is possible to see how humans and animals actually create a shared landscape in which they constantly attune their activities to one another in the production of a shared environment. So, okay, that's the theory. Now, how does that all work out if we go and look at one of the cases we've been working on in our research? The case we want to put forward is that of the future of privately owned historic estates in Flanders. We are interested in these places. They are seen as, uh, seem to represent many values, for instance, at the level of heritage protection, uh, tourism and nature preservation. Contemporary Belgian inheritance legislation and the demise of traditional agricultural economy offer presents these places with many challenges. In short, having seen many traditional source, sources of income evaporate and faced with often strict regulation, which curtails the possibility for the development of new profitable practices, they need to reinvent themselves to keep afloat in the future. Could taking the animal gaze seriously somehow point to a reinvention of such places? Well, first off, we tend to spend far too much time and attach far too much importance, at least in our view, to these kinds of things when we are thinking about a new future for these places. Historic plans that present an estate as a fixed object, created in the vision of an architect or landscape architect and imposed on the landscape. Of course, in an Ingoldian view, an estate as an object in itself makes no sense at all. The estate is a node in the meshwork of relations and its identity and form are always in the process of becoming. It's a specific weaving together of different currents or threads of life, specific to a given time and co-constitutive of a specific place. Indeed, as a node, the estate weaves together different currents of life in its own specific way. And it is from that that it derives its specific identity. The lives of animals, so to speak, are always already interwoven into that meshwork. We only need to look at their traces and see how they help to develop the estate into what it is today and what it will be in the future. Think, for instance, about the massive role hunting has played in the development of these places. The building, development, and maintenance of many estates was, of course, a direct reaction to a specific way in which humans and animals were already enmeshed in each other's lives. And the building and designing of the estate itself 
help to further unfold and shape this mutual enmeshment. Indeed, without that prior practical involvement with animals, this mutual enmeshment of humans and animal lives, the specific practices shapes, oh, sorry, the specific practices and shapes that these relationships generated make no sense at all. Form is not imposed on matter from the outside, but is an epiphenomenon riding on our practical involvement, the involvement with the world. Therefore, the identity of an estate should not be reduced to any kind of originary design act, not even to a sequence of such acts. Form is the result of the constant weaving and unweaving of different currents of life, some temporal trajectories, such as those of buildings, for instance, or landscaping measures, might play out over longer ranges than, for instance, the lives of individual animals and humans. But their identity and form is nevertheless determined by the continuous weaving into the currents of life. Take, for instance, the way in which estates drew together humans and non-humans in the context of them being productive agricultural places, the way in which humans and non-human lives were entangled in those days, generated many of the buildings and landscape forms that are part and parcel of the layout of many domains today. However, today, most Flemish estates draw together humans and animals in a wholly different way. The domesticated animals have largely disappeared and have been replaced by a varied set of non-domesticated free roaming animals. Of course, many owners actually lament this evolution the old agricultural way of weaving together the landscape is unraveling, and the meaning and potential future use of the new weave is still fully unfolding and unfamiliar. However, we strongly believe that in order to look for a new future for these spaces, we need to reinterpret the identity and function of estates. We should no longer see them as fixed objects imposed on the landscape in a singular act of human creative intervention, but as meshworks, specific ways of interweaving different currents of life. Working on the future of estates is working on that meshwork, analyzing it, strengthening it, allowing it to reweave or unweave in certain places, rather than working on the maintenance of a fixed object. We arrived at this reinterpretation by trying to make the animal gaze or try to take the animal gaze seriously in landscape design, thinking about the role and function of animals in landscape and landscape design, apart from the possibility of, apart from possibly being an ethical necessity, can, according to us, function as a strong heuristic tool to lay bare entrenched presuppositions about landscape and design. And this is precisely what we have been doing in our research as well, using different animals, in this case, a bat as a heuristic tool to reconceive estates as nodes in an unfolding meshwork, uh, meshwork and looking for ways to reconceive estates. One example we want to, I want to finish my presentation on is a couple of examples or a couple of um, Concrete realizations which came from the research, uh, research which worked with bats as a heuristic tool to reinterpret estates. And of course, there are many reasons to choose bats, but the reasons we, uh, we thought were, were the most important were, of course, that bats are typical estate species. And the, the kind of environment, the habitat provided by estates suits bats very well. There are lots of old trees, there's lots of water, there's lots of old buildings. There are ice cellars in the beginning film, you saw the ice cellar of one of the estates we are working with. Um, these are places where bats like to hibernate and so forth. So bats are typical estate species. There are also quite clear symbols of the kind of landscape transformation estates have been going through over the last couple of years, or even uh, the, 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 the last couple of decennia, where we see this shift from these agricultural species towards these more free roaming species. And bats are, of course, also landscape species par excellence. Uh, their lives weave together many other currents in the landscape, and they therefore enmesh uh, the estate in a much larger landscape network as well. Now, 
one of the things we try to do when we're doing our research is try to kind of jolt humans out of an all too human view of landscape. So we try to imagine, try to work on how does a bet actually draw the landscape of the estates or draw the landscape of different uh, places around the escape together? How does the bet weave all kinds of threads of life, all kinds of currents of life going on around the estate together? And how does that decenter us as the human? So we try, for instance, to draw maps uh, uh, starting off from the bet experience of the surroundings. We try to um, make sketches, develop kind of uh, views of what it would mean to mesh, for instance, human necessities in the landscape with those of bats. For instance, how can we couple, uh, couple a village with a, a particular estate so that both humans and animals, bats in this case, can move forward between the two. We also had some projects, which uh, more projects with students, in which we were wondering: can we more, can we, uh, for instance, involve animals, and in this case again, bats in particular, more directly with making up plans for the future of certain estates. This led to interesting projects or the interesting art idea of how can art start the cross-species conversation, in one, which one group. Um, worked on creating a performance around the theme of I would like to talk to a bet, but would like would it like to talk uh, with me? In which they tried to communicate or start at least a communication with bets, fully realizing that bets might not even um, get that people were trying to communicate with it. So these are kind of um, um, Maquettes they made um, uh, to show the kind of places where they would be uh, having their um, um, their performance. Other people in this group uh, used different parts of houses and made them uninhabitable for humans, but uh, allowed bats or tried to allow bats to stay in them. We also tried to, like you saw in the beginning movie, which is like I said mostly made up or, or filmed with uh, lighter uh, cameras around the eye cellar of one of the domains we we're working with um, in order to um, get a kind of inkling of how bats might perceive the landscape and how this might change our views, our ideas about landscape and landscape perception, perception as well, um, which might open up new ways of looking at these places or these landscapes and how can they feed them back into a future future development of these places. We had students in digital design also working on concepts of how to reconnect people which are outside of the estates we're working with, with the more than human world inside uh, the domains. These particular students were not working on bats, but they were uh, working on, I think it's a lime tree in English, yes, I'm not sure it's a tilia, uh, uh, lime tree, um, um, which uh, through kind of a digital interface, they could learn more about the life story of these uh, of the tree and have uh, um, performed different actions which might uh, enhance the world of uh, the lime tree and which shows the many interconnections uh, uh, other more than human actors on the domain have with these uh, lime trees. Another project uh, from digital design students was to develop uh, a kind of concept for touristic uh, purposes in which they developed hotel rooms which were connected through all kinds of sensors with the outside world and non-human actors on estates on the outside world so that people who would uh, stay in these hotel rooms would have uh, the experience of one of those non-human actors out in the larger estate. Um, different hotel rooms would have different experiences. So if everybody wakes up in the morning, they have something to talk about their experience as a more than human actor on this domain at breakfast, uh, of course. This is from the same project. So yet another, and I'll, I'll close with this kind of example we developed is the cards uh, for more than humanity, um, which we developed in, uh, 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 very recently, which is actually a card game which helps designers 
architects, landscape designers, all kinds of designers reconsider or think again about the types of projects they are developing. Are they projects uh, which also take, for instance, the uh, animal viewpoint, the animal gaze into account? And uh, if not, how can we do that? And how does that change our view of the kind of design projects and processes we're uh, developing at uh, a certain moment? So this more or less concludes my talk. This gives, I think, a an, an, an good overview of what we are doing in our think tank, the Center for Decentering Design. We are trying to um, uh, develop all these kinds of things, systemize these kinds of um, design interventions we're doing into uh, a kind of methodology, uh, decentering design, we like to co uh, call it. We also would like to develop a kind of toolkit. We're about halfway through our research. Um, we're happy uh, for everybody to contact us uh, who wants to join us on this journey. You might have ideas, might be working on similar ideas. So yes, um, I thank you very much for uh, having us for, your, uh, for this talk. Thanks, thanks very much. So Bert, that, that um, was really great. Um, and, and also Glenn for delivering it. I know it's a joint paper, so thank you so much for that. And I can see why you said that you needed to read it out because it was very um, careful. Um, and the, the concepts that you were discussing require real care and thought. And so I absolutely applaud you. I thought it was fascinating um, and I, I really enjoyed it. And I'm sure uh, there will be lots of stimulating discussion, but before we, we go to that, can I turn to your respondent, Andrea Gammon? Um, she's an assistant professor uh, of ethics and philosophy of technology at the Technical University of Delft. And Andrea's earlier work involved looking at philosophy and ethics of rewilding, although in the meantime, she's moved on to, uh, to focusing more on the integration and the improvement of ethics education in STEM subjects. I'm sure they're not unrelated uh, in any way to one another. Um, so I, I'm going to give you the floor, Andrea, and, and, and ask you to, uh, to offer us a response uh, to this excellent paper from Glenn and uh, from Bert. Thank you. Yeah, okay, thank you. I just was looking at the comment in the chat already. We have questions. So I will, um, I, I guess I was, I was told about 10 minutes. I might make it a little shorter than that. Um, let me just set a timer so I know how long I've gone. Okay. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much, Glenn and Baird for this, this project or the project that you've described, as well as the um, opportunity to, to comment and open up for other questions and comments from, from the audience. Um, hang on, I've lost my notes now. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, what I'm going to, I've prepared some comments and then I might leave a little bit of time because I have now new questions having heard the whole, the whole paper. Um, so anyway, let me start with what I've prepared. Um, what I wanted to do first was talk about two of the main themes that this project brings out so nicely, and then a, a tension I sense between them. Um, and yeah, we can just go from there. So yeah, so first I'll talk about these two themes, and I think it gives us also a little bit more time to think about some of the key ideas that Glenn has presented. Um, so the first, the first theme that I take to be really central here is of perception. And I think that this project kind of turns our way of thinking about perception around. So unlike typical, maybe in other, yeah, presentations of landscape, we think maybe we you know, erroneously think of ourselves as the viewers, the ones who are in charge, who are the ones who are gazing at the world. Um, and this project, of course, starts from the uncanny recognition that we're not the only ones who are gazing, but that we are the, the humans can also be gazed upon by the non-human. So we go from being the seers 
or the yeah the visionaries or whatever to to being the objects of perception by animals so this is the observation by derrida that the gaze of the animal other is a gaze that we um, we recognize because it it reminds us of the human gaze. It demands something of us. We feel ourselves seen as a person in it, but it's also really other to us. It's foreign. It's an absolute other um, that's not like the human gaze. And a further move beyond Derrida, I think, that this project makes is that once we're aware that yeah, the cat or the animal other has this gazing perspective. Um, on us, we can see that just as well as it can, the cat can look at us, the cat can look away. The cat can look at something else like a landscape um, from its own singular perspective. It can look at other things. So the gaze of the animal is also the gaze of something or someone that can also look elsewhere. I like this thought for two reasons that are related to each other. First, because it really challenges this, the, the prevailing view um, that the world is increasingly made by humans, it's made for us, um, we're making it all the time and we can only really see ourselves in it. This is the kind of Anthropocene view that no matter where you are in the world, no matter where you go or where you look, you see the human around you. And instead, I think this reminds us that other animals that who live in these landscapes with us they don't necessarily see it this way. Um, and secondly, if we think about trying to imagine their perspectives, that we can encounter a non-human, a, a world that's not centered around us. So I think that's a really, a really exciting and an interesting idea. And I think this idea comes out really nicely in the in the well, one of the projects that Glenn described about the. Um, considering how the bat might not even want, well, maybe it doesn't even recognize that we're trying to approach it and be in touch with it, but also that it may not want to talk with us. And I think that this is a, this poses such a challenge to the way that we, that our very human centric way of thinking about ourselves in the world. Um, additionally, and I think Derrida helps us see this point, um, we're not used to thinking of the perspective as, no, sorry, we're not, um, we, we are used to thinking of the sort of symbolic animal. But what Derrida asks us to do is think about like the individual cat seeing from their individual singular perspective and not standing in for all of the other cats. And I think that this, um, we have a tendency to lapse into these kind of symbolic ways of treating animals. Um, and a project like this kind of asks us to think about what it is to look from their perspective, from these multiple different perspectives, some of which we can access, some of which maybe we maybe are harder for us to access. So this, yeah, that's a question that I might raise if I have time, but we'll come back to that. Okay, so I've talked about the first theme of perception and the ways that this project asks us to think differently or asks us to envision new ways of perceiving. The other theme that's, I think, even maybe more conceptually challenging is this, the landscape as, as being made concept, right, the Ingold idea. Um, so, so landscape, we're, we're moving away from this, the, 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 um, the substrate view of landscape as this form that we imprint our lives on. Um, but instead, we think of it as, as being constantly made, as we're, we're constantly doing landscape. It's an activity rather than a natural form. And this is something that we make through inhabiting or dwelling in the world, like other animals. Um, this turns our thinking on its head too, right? I mean, this most of, or not most, a lot of Glenn's talk was talking about how this is really a revisioning of the landscape concepts from, um, from Descartes on. Um, but it asks us to think about this kind of mesh, about collective practices and forms of life as always being in a process of making landscape. Um, this gives us an entirely new way of thinking about historical formations of, of like this, these landscapes, land, these estate landscapes and how we should think about them in the present. So on the whole, I think these two themes of perception and of landscape making, I think we've seen that they are fitting complements to each other through this project. 
But I also think there are ways in which they might be in tension with each other. Um, and so this is a question that I maybe, yeah, this is a question that occurs to me and maybe others share it and maybe this is something that, that can be responded to. Um, because it seems to me as though um, the if we focus on perception and even trying to perceive, try us as humans, landscape designers, et cetera, trying to perceive the way that other animals perceive the landscape, trying to sort of step into their shoes in a way, um, that this, already gets us, I don't know, this is my question, I guess. It feels like it might get us away from this kind of making mode of landscape, that it's more of a passive kind of understanding way of, of, of thinking. But I'm not sure if that is really a tension at all. Um, that's a question that I have. Um, let me think of another, let me just scroll through what I have. Um, yeah, so another way, another question that I had that came up as Glenn was talking today. I like how you, how the I like the choice of the bat because in lots of ways the bat is a really foreign animal. It's not one that we um, have domesticated. It's not the one that we have close practices with or you know, we don't keep bats as pets. We don't see bats in the face very often. Um, and so one other question that I I like I like the idea of using the bat as a heuristic for these for these points. But then I also wonder if we lose a little bit of the sort of singularity of the individual bat if it stands in as this kind of heuristic role. Um, and then another question I would have would be if you were thinking about doing a project like this again, and if like what kind of other animal perspectives you might think about including, or if this could be something even that students think of, which animals perhaps interest them or that they'd like to adopt perspectives of or try to understand um, in ways of mapping or ways of understanding the space. Um, and then finally, and this is maybe the most, uh, this will be my last question, but I think it's a, I take it to be kind of a difficult one. Um, when I, I'm really enraptured by this idea of the mesh work and by design, by thinking of landscape as this form of designing that we're always doing, whether we think about it or not. But then I also want to know what happens to the sort of intentional practices of design. Um, if we're, yeah, if we're always kind of designing alongside animals, co-creating the landscape, um, whether we whether we do that intentionally, whether we do that deliberately and inclusively or not, well, what happens when we do try to make these kinds of practices inclusive, or we do try to think deliberately about what a good design would be for a landscape? Are we doing something? additional to the normal designing of landscape that we're doing by just living and inhabiting and dwelling in the ways that we do? Or is there something, yeah, um, are these not so at odds from each other? Um, okay, so that I think is exactly 10 minutes and I will then, I, I hope that this raises questions for other people um, and otherwise, yeah, I have other questions if no one has any, but I will turn the floor over Maybe I'll hand the uh, moderation back to Connor. Okay, thank you very much for those observations, Andrea. I can tell from his demeanor that Glenn is carefully taking notes and I'm sure uh, you know you have something to, to say to that very uh, rich perspective uh, on your paper, Glenn, before we open it back up to the the floor, and I'm sure also if Bert wants to come in, you'll invite him in as well. But I'm going to hand it back to you, Glenn, for the moment, and other people can then start to gather their thoughts and collect their response as well. But thank you, Andrea, for that. Sure, uh, thank you, thank you very much, Andrea, for your very careful and thorough response and your your challenging questions, which uh, I do um, I do recognize, and indeed, Bert, uh, but also Mirta and Kiljam are here. Uh, so the whole research team is here. So if somebody wants to step in, please feel free uh, to do so. Yeah, this idea, of, I, I mean, I, I fully agree with this idea of the Anthropocene. Of course, there are maybe two kinds of ways of looking on the, at the Anthropocene. There is this narrative of the humanizing of the world and not you know, being able to encounter the other anymore. There's, of course, also this story of Anthropocene means precisely this type of enmeshment of the human and the more than human more and more. But I, I fully agree with that. And I think it's an interesting take, which, which, I, hadn't, uh, which I hadn't thought of. Um, 
Now, with regards with your tension or the idea of the tension of, um, you know, when we try to look through the animal's eyes, and this is an, an attempt by us, try to look through the animal's eyes at the landscape, whether we then not, uh, whether we aren't then in danger of kind of repeating the kind of uh, vision or relationship towards the landscape, which we try to escape from. Yes, I think, um, I think that is true. Um, and I think we should fight this kind of, of tension. I think that's the reason why looking through the animal's eyes is for us a kind of first heuristic step, for instance, or a first heuristic step. This is something we simply use to jolt humans out of their um, human prejudice, so to speak, to let them see that there are also other beings out there which uh, have a kind of meaningful relationship Towards the animal, uh, towards the landscape, and draw this la this landscape together in their own way. And I think what I tried to show there was what I tried to to point to in my own description of the presentation as well is indeed we should not fall into the trap of like simply keeping on a kind of Cartesian worldview and just saying that animals have minds as well and perceive the landscape, because then we we, we get into a kind of yeah. Um, um, we have a multiplication of different kind of landscapes views, landscape views, but not this idea of a kind of co-created, co-shared landscape, nor do we then necessarily move into this idea of landscape as a kind of activity and not something to be gazed at, to be seen as a kind of fixed subject. So I see the tension and I hope we, we, we are aware of it in the project and um, we will be careful to deal with it uh, in uh, the, the the future. Um, maybe. Yeah. So, yeah, Bert? Glenn, yeah, maybe I would like to. I, I also wrote something down and I think it adds up to, to what you said. Um, thank you for, for your questions, also, Andrea. Uh, what I really thought was interesting is that you said that there is a kind of tension between uh, our efforts to kind of perceive the landscape from an animal perspective and, and to understand and we definitely failed in doing it. We always will fail in perceiving uh, as an animal the landscape. So it's in the effort that it's interesting. But you said that there's a tension between uh, the effort to perceive and kind of landscape making, and that uh, by focusing on perceiving, maybe we, 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 we disconnect from making landscape, uh, if I uh, am correct in your question. And yeah, what, it's, <laughs> it's really more of a question. Like I'm not, yeah. I, I don't have an answer to that. But, but yeah. what I find interesting is that along the way that we, we started to understand and we also um, started to call the estate kind of um, an interface for cross-species um, communication and, and um, connection. And for us, slowly um, trying to connect to other animals is becoming an effort to transform the landscape. For example, the students that made kind of this... Um, 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 I can't come up with the show or kind of the performance that they did to kind of to try to communicate with, with, with bats. They also said, yeah, we will have to change the landscape to, to be able to do our performance. We have to do things. We have to be able to climb in trees. We have to be able to understand how uh, a bat maybe feeds. So we have to kind of create an atmosphere in which the bat can feed and can eat his evening meal. And that we are sitting there as well having our evening meal and maybe we recognize each other having our meal together. And it's the, the, the effort in trying to communicate and trying to understand other points of view is becoming also making the landscape and transforming the landscape. And that is something that I find really interesting um, that was really not kind of a starting point that um, everything that we do, for example, we, there was also a student project that said Bats can pass certain points with, which have sensors, and um, if they choose to pass sensor A, they communicate something else to us than when they pass sensor B in the landscape. And as such, they can communicate to us by choosing their flight route. And maybe if we do it two, three years, they will slowly change their flight route because they like communicating uh, with, uh, in this way with us. And the landscape will change by that effort. So that's something that I find really interesting is that it is a it is kind of a transformative, there is a certain transformative element in it. 
So that's why I wanted to, to answer uh, your question because it's a tension that we felt in the beginning as well. Maybe Mirth or Gilliam might like to, to offer something from their perspective on the project as well. No, 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 I don't have uh, anything to add to that as of yet. Okay. okay. I do, but I, I don't have a voice at the moment. So. Okay. <laughs> it has been a bit ill. Okay. Um, Maybe it's good to, to answer the question as well of Natasha. Uh, and there was a question. Yes, it's more. Comment. Yeah. Um, so Natasha is essentially coming in from the chat and saying, um, are um, the observation that many indigenous people do, do not see themselves as being separate from nature. And so in that sense, I mean, I, I suppose we're looking at a quite a Western uh, a kind of epistemology here. We're looking at a Cartesian and a phenomenological uh, perspective on landscape, which seems to be kind of there embedded at the core of the of the definition of landscape in the European Landscape Convention. But I think this is where your paper is so timely because uh, that's no longer as palatable um, as it may once have been. And particularly when we look at the various uh, challenges facing the planet right now, mm -hmm. um, that kind of perspective, the anthropomorphic, if you like, perspective is is not really good enough anymore um if i could just make a comment and say that i think that that uh, that uh, tim mingle's use of the phrase creative entanglements is in fact even richer than the mesh the idea that these threads like those spiders webs that there's just one filament that blows through the air and entangles with other things that that entanglement is the creative process that things can entangle and disentangle. And, and I think that's the important thing. It's actually the disentangling that, that creates the, the, uh, the moment for new realities to form uh, by you know, uh, uniting in different shapes and different architectural forms, if you permit me to use that phrase. But um, I, 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 I think at this stage, if anyone else has any comment or question if you want to raise your hand I, I can see someone has put something into the chat room there's one second here it's from joe boonen it's uh when you observe animal behavior it would seem logical that each animal or plant forms the landscape in such a way to ensure their own survival would you agree with this or do you see other animals besides humans that shape the landscape in ways that are not necessarily connected to survival only it's a very interesting observation so any uh, are all of you from the project might like to answer that? Oh, yeah, well, it's an interesting question. Uh, you all, thank you very much. Um, I think there are definite examples. Well, shaping of the landscape, I should really look into that, but how far does one go? If you, for instance, look, I, I don't know how they are called in English, but birds of paradise, are they, are they mm -hmm. th those very, who have very kind of elaborate kind of um, uh, nesting and um, uh, bolts, I don't know how to call it, mm -hmm. like when they do their dance yeah. to attract yeah. females, basically. Um, the way they shape or the way they clean, um, make their environment, their small environment, of course, it their, their, their scale pretty, Yes, of course, you can say this is all kind of survival related. Yes, that's true. But there seems to be a kind of surplus there, which cannot be reduced to mere function. They seem to take pride in these kinds of things. So it's not mere functionality. There are, of course, many examples where you see animals um, um, developing sort of behaviors which are not um, not directly tied to survival. There is this very well-documented case of uh, bonobo, so a type of um, uh, primates, I think it's in English, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, um, who put straws in their ears. There's no reason why they should put straws in their ears, but it seems to have been a fashion which was, was, was uh, started at a certain point. They know which bonobo first put straw in her ears, 
and all females in the groups followed for several generations as a kind of fashion accessory to put straws in their ears. So not all kind of behavior that animals have can be reduced to function. And even those behaviors like you have in you know, human behavior, um, many human behaviors can be reduced back to uh, evolutionary function as well. But there seems to be a kind of surplus in meaning in human behaviors, which tend to be, or we can also recognize in many animal behavior. And it is this surplus of meaning which leads us well to think is the reduction to function or functionality in the case of survival and so forth is that, um, well, why, why are we always prone to make this reduction in a certain sense? Or, or why wouldn't we grant that this surplus of meaning, this idea that they can take pride in these kinds of things, the fact that there might be a differentiation between function and motivation for these de doing these things. Yeah, one can, uh, certain evolutionary, you know, a certain behavior can have a certain evolutionary function. It can have a certain function in reproduction and so forth, but that does not necessarily mean that an animal performs that type of behavior simply because of that function or simply with the goal of reproducing itself or surviving in a certain, uh, in a certain place. Yeah. Glenn, I think there's an implication in the question as well that um, your, your observation of, you know, uh, the creation of surplus meaning, um, you know, that somehow or other that uh, human behavior is predominantly not about survival, but in fact, it's all about survival. It's just that uh, I, I, I think in the human world, uh, beyond the, the fundamentals of uh, food and warmth and moisture, um, that um, all of our social behavior is about survival in the social domain in any case. You know, so I think that that all species work to their own survival. Um, if you broaden out the term uh, out beyond the Darwinian one of 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 mere uh, kind of biological survival, there's a lot more to it than that. And I think our behaviors, that's what makes us so complex, I think, as, as species. And I think that's what the European Landscape Convention is really trying to speak to. It's trying to uh to to use your own phrase to jolt us out of a kind of a torpor of understanding of the world that we have uh created but i think that your work is is uh so important in reminding us that that we're not the sole uh creators that we're co-creators and that therefore we have to behave in a way that's respectful to our fellow creators on the the uh, planet and we're not going to be here forever and we haven't been here forever mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so in fact if you think about it the planet that we inherited uh, is one that uh, managed very well without us <laughs> um, I wonder does anybody else have a comment or, or observation uh, to make if you want uh, to type it into the the, uh, the chat but otherwise just uh, turn on your mic and ask a question. I think there's not that many people in the room that we're not going to be able to control this. So if you have a question or observation or something you'd like to say, just switch on your mic and uh, talk. Silence. I'm happy to reply to two more points Andrea raised. Um, in, in the, so I don't want to, to yeah. um, monopolize the floor in, in any way. So please, please do, yeah. do please do. Ask so Natasha your, has your put question. another question in there, Glenn. She says, I have a, uh, uh, she has tamed a feral cat and her behavior has definitely changed in the landscape. Now that she's not constantly looking for food, she's more playful and definitely looks at me differently. Good for you. I have six hens and every single one of them has a different character. <laughs> so I think uh, um, we've all got experience of this. And also I, I was interested, as you were saying, just to fill in the space a little bit, you know, um, where the bats are where that we were trying or you were trying to communicate with them, you know, um, when you live with an animal, that's non-verbal in the, in the kind of conventional sense as we're being verbal now. 
they're very good at communicating with you, you know. Um, so maybe it's not so much a question of us trying to communicate with them, uh, but actually of being attentive to what it is that they're trying to communicate to mm -hmm. us. In maybe this. I, want, I want to add to this because um, maybe it's good to understand a little bit our backgrounds as well. Um, so I'm uh, actually uh, four people, we are with four people in the project, and I think only Glenn has an extensive knowledge on animal behavior and how animals use the landscape. And we are with three people that don't have that knowledge. Mm -hmm. And that's very interesting because we believe that it is important that we learn to understand those different signals without having an extensive knowledge. Because if you want to change how we design landscapes, mm -hmm. we can't educate everybody uh, to become experts in this. And we can't also uh, get always uh, all the specific experts for each specific species involved in a design assignment. So we think how can we, without actual in-depth knowledge, kind of transform our way of, of designing these, these places. And it's indeed um, in the first walk that we did at night uh, with uh, David. Uh, David is a, a person who, who um, helps us understanding the bats uh, in the specific location. And he really explains it, uh, or he said, yeah, I can feel that the bats are, are um, uh, giving us a welcome, that they are trying to see, ah, oh, who is this group that's coming today? Uh, why are they here? That they are flying in patterns that they are not their normal behavior, probably, because we are there. And not behavior that they are afraid, but behavior that they are curious, mm -hmm. that they want to learn what's happening there. Mm -hmm. So, but when, when I'm walking there, it's not something that I sense directly, but just by a few things that are explained by David, you start kind of feeling differently towards what's happening. And you see these certain, uh, certain kind of um, uh, bats uh, really quickly passing by, but you start seeing the same animal coming back and back and back. So it's really interesting that from background that is really not in this field, that through this project, you start looking differently. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, something that I wanted to add. Yeah, but that's, that's a really enriching experience. Yeah. It's, it's fantastic. I think also it, it might go not all the way, but maybe also some way to Andrea's last question about this whole idea of when we are having these participative design methodologies, such as more than human participatory design and so forth, are we then doing something else than what we're always doing? Or how do we figure that in? Mm -hmm. I think that's a very interesting question, a difficult one to ask, uh, to, to answer. But I think it does have to do with this idea of attunement and perception, right? Um, according, for, Ingold doesn't have a kind of flat ontology, right? So humans and animals are more complex than plants are definitely more complex than rocks and so forth. And part of the complexity or most of the complexity is in the fact that we are perceptive. And uh, because we are perceptive, we can attune, actively attune towards the environment in a certain sense. And probably, I'm not sure, but one way of maybe answering this is that when we go through these um, very conscious kind of participatory research modes or uh, sorry, the, these more participatory kind of design practices, what we do is we train our attunement and we enlarge our attunement. Yes, the more than human world is, will always be somehow present in whatever design we do. There is no way we can avoid that. We constantly believe we avoid it, but we don't. But that does not mean that we cannot actively enlarge or you know, um, uh, sharpen our attunement to that world. And like that says, I think walking with someone like David, who has such an extensive knowledge of bats, um, opens that attunement and, 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 and you know, um, lets you go deeper is the wrong kind of metaphor to use, but, you know, makes you aware of much more goings on in the landscape in, in a certain sense. And I think somehow, somewhere there should be a kind of beginning of an answer to, to, to I think, the last question. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I also thought it was interesting when you were describing your decision to focus on bats that you, I think you said they're like experts in the enmeshing, like because of their role in the landscape. And so I wondered if that was something that like could be like a kind of, uh, yeah, could be learned by uh, people doing this kind of work as designers, what kinds of like specific traits it would mean to be an expert in the enmeshing. I think that that's, I mean, maybe some of these are things you, that are emulatable and others not. But, I, th- but I, I, yeah, to me, this idea of attuning to these specific dimensions so that, well, that just rich in, you know, enriches your experience. But then also, I think probably for designers, there are specific then, yeah, I don't know, actions or things that can come out of that in addition to having this richer world around you. I think that's exactly what we, or that, that's a part of what we aim to do with kind of the last slide that we showed, kind of these cards for more than humanity, that you have kind of certain simple actions that can be performed during a design process that help you attune better to the more than human world. That uh, although not thinking about it, although not um, a direct goal of your design assignment, that these actions and we are still figuring out what these actions could be and how they can be translated from project to project to project. So how can they become a kind of general set of tools or questions? So that's something that we don't have the answer yet, but that's kind of the ultimate goal that's to, to find out what can we do, for example, just walk around. Um, we have read research that said, okay, just walk around with the camera uh, at the height of a dog eyes already makes you understand and if you look at the film how a dog perceives a landscape and you suddenly start to um, think of it when designing that uh, part of the landscape or part of the walk that you did with the dog that's that's also a point of view that's possible Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's maybe in these tiny things within a design process that there can be made a huge difference in the end I might have to leave the last question to Sasha, uh, Sasha Dobrici. Um, you oh. have your hand raised, so unmute your mic, Sasha. And... Oh, I apologize. I, I actually didn't notice that I raised hand because I was enjoying so much, so much this conversation and I was relaxed. But anyway, it's not difficult to comment this beautiful lecture. It is so much in line with our call on our last conference that we are just co-designers with the extended community of living beings. So uh, thank you very much for having so systematically and also visually presented your project. However, uh, thinking about the cat and the gaze of the cat that also Andrea says, I was thinking that animals are really able that to observe with no need to interve- of intervention. And maybe this is also something that we should learn, that we should finally enjoy also our own impotence and just be very ac- accurate observers, uh, which is sometimes difficult for designers. And um, another thing, um, now you gave me the word, so I, I-, I will finish. <laughs> Actually, I have very much enjoyed this, uh, that you have introduced the cultural component of nature. Uh, we, we, we really forget about this uh, uh, in this dichotomy, how much, and we just, we stop on the threshold between nature and culture, but actually nature has a strong cultural component because um, culture is something that actually we learn while behavior is probably something that we can inherit it as a biological um, uh, inheritance. So, um, so if behavior is what we do, but culture is what we learn, then culture is often very much a process of conformity, okay? But actually culture depends on individuals who do not entirely conform. So it was also interesting to see that uh, animals can act like this, actually. they can turn their gaze away and not participate at all. So. Uh, so I have really enjoyed very much, and um, there are many things that, that I have noted. And again, thank you very much. It was a very beautiful lecture. 
Thank you very much. That was a very fortuitous raising of the hand. Um, <laughs> and you will leave me with that phrase for the rest of the evening. Enjoy your own impotence. Um, and I think that should be the philosophy of the day. It's an awful pity that a, a certain man in the Kremlin doesn't know how to enjoy his own impotence, but perhaps he will have time to do that in due course. But in the meantime, can I add my voice to that of Sasha and just to thank uh, Glenn in particular, that was that was a, was a really great. Um, I wish um, I, I would be in touch with you. I'm very interested in the topic, in the, uh, the presentation, the approach that you take. And I think also, um, you, you know, for anyone interested in the more philosophical dimension of the European Landscape Convention and of landscape generally, there was meat and vegetables and drink in this uh, talk. Uh, and I want to congratulate you and your colleagues, all four who were there, and, and also to thank Andrea. It was really lovely to meet you um, and for your very stimulating response uh, to the paper as well. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank everyone for participating, everyone who was present, and we look forward to seeing you at the next of Where the Disciplines Meets lectures. Uh, we'll advertise that in due course. So thank you so much. <laughs>